Disclaimer. Please check your playback settings. Ensure you are listening to this podcast at normal speed. Unless you want us to sound drunk. Then play at half speed. Thank you. He sounds like Dr. Connery. (laughs) (laughs) I have Doc, what's the prognosis? Well, from these CT scans, I see a disturbing amount of brain lesions from all of these concussions. If they take another blow to the head, it could result in some serious, permanent brain damage. Now, here is the church. Uh And and here is the steeple. Yeah. Uh Open the doors and see all the... That's a penis. Are you sure they don't already? This is a total Rocky V situation here. I cannot stress this enough. No additional head trauma. Here, take these helmets and uh, make sure they wear them for at least the next couple of weeks because they need the time to heal. Are these made of nerf? Can't say that legally, but they should help soften any light blows. Just whatever you do, don't have them do anything overly strenuous. Don't put them in any possible situations that could get hurt. Just let them sit down and watch TV. Uh, that shouldn't be too hard. They're lazy enough as it is, so... <laughs> he said hard. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Doc. I'll see what I can do. Two, three... <clears throat> Stop it! Stop it now! So, according to the doctor, we need to keep you two out of harm's way. So, be sure to always wear those helmets and let me take over the next tournament. It shouldn't be that hard. It's... <laughs> what? No, stop that! Don't make me come back there. For the last time, keep your heads off each other's heads, young men. Nope. I hear you. Three. No, no, no. that's it. That's it. No ice cream. Okay, God. <laughs> guys, seriously, the doctor said don't. You could cause serious brain damage. And we need to get through this next leg of the tournament if we're going to go to... What is the next leg of the tournament supposed to be? Jousting! Medieval Knight Tournament, remember? Ooh, sword fighting. Hey, let's play with our swords. Ooh. Zip that back up, young man. Stay in the back seat. Speaking of which, why are we in the back seat? Because someone keeps grabbing the steering wheel, and I'm not getting into another who's sitting where bit. And keep those helmets on, for God's sakes! I don't want you getting brain damage anymore. Tom, Tom, Dan, I gotta pee. Oh, for the love of, I told you to go before we left. I didn't have to go then. Jeez, Jesus, I have to go pee too. Oh, just wait till we get there, okay? Tom? Josh? Are, are we there yet? No! Are we there yet? No! But I gotta pee! I know you do! Just, it's not gonna be that long. Just find something else to think about until then. Okay. One. Two, no. Two. no! 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 Yeah, no! Yeah, let's watch a movie, guys. and sliding into home with the classic Chadwick Boseman film about the legendary Jackie Robinson himself, 42! It's curveballs and clinch plays every Tuesday here at the Fire Pit. Play it all! Good evening, bots and listeners, and welcome to another exciting episode of the Fire Pit Podcast. I'm Josh, the wrong one, Reginald here, and we've lobbed and served right out of last week's movie, thank God. And thankfully, we are continuing on, striking out towards 42. And as per our rules, we've taken an actor or an actress from our last film and moved them on over to this one. Now, to tell us about what we're watching and who we're watching, 
I'm going to go ahead and pitch on over to Nigel. Thank you, Josh. Dan, the angry one, Nigel here, and welcome back. Last week, we watched Paul Bettany and Kirsten Dunst volley back and forth over who wanted to suck more in 2004's Wimbledon. They both did. Hopefully, the man with a vision, <laughs> see what I did there, fares a bit better tonight as he stars with Heath Ledger in The Dark Knight, landmark Marvel vs. DC film that... Dan. What? Here. I, oh. Okay. <clears throat> okay, okay, okay. Let's see here. Heath Ledger, Paul Bettany. Oh, okay. Oh, oh! Heath Ledger in 2001's A Knight's Tale, a film that has nothing to do with Batman and also nothing to do with medieval Europe, but I digress. <laughs> <laughs> to give us more of a rundown on the film, I'll send the call to Tom in the bullpen. Coming on up, coach! Nice recovery, Nigel! Tom, the editor, Thompson here, and as mentioned, we are watching 2001's A Night Tale, a, air quotes, historical piece starring Heath Ledger, Paul Bettany, Rufus Sewell, or Sewell, my apologies to Rufus for mispronouncing it, Alan Tujic, and Shannon Soshaman, Sosaman, there are two S's there. This movie... A Night's Tale was released May 11th, 2001, and has a running time of 132 minutes, a budget of $65 million, and a box office of $117.5 million. Actually did better than I thought it did. However, its score on Rotten Tomato is 56%, with an audience score of 79%, and an IMDb of 7 out of 10. Actually, surprisingly more popular than I thought it was going to be in terms of the audience. I'm impressed. But before I ramble on any more about box offices and expectations, let me ramble on about the meta. Welcome to A Knight's Tale. Tagline, from peasant to knight, one man can change his stars. Summary. When a knight dies during the recession of a fight, one of his squires, William Thatcher, played by Heath Ledger, disguises himself as his master in order to win the prize money of the tournament. He wins the fight, and together with his fellow squires, Watt and Roland, Alan Tojic and Mark Addy, respectively, he decides to take on a new false identity as a knight. Along the way, they meet Geoffrey Chaucer, played by Paul Bettany, a poor writer who joins the group, and the quartet travels through England and France fighting in tournaments. This movie is very loosely inspired, air quotes, by the Canterbury Tales written by Geoffrey Chaucer, a historical writer very famous to English majors. The events of this film supposedly take place in a brief six-month period where he went missing. This movie kind of rides the trend of the Shakespeare in Love-inspired movies where it's loosely based on or inspired by fictional tales with real-world historical figures as sort of the anchor point. Think um, Da Vinci and Cinderella, the, the movie with Drew Barrymore. And the real-world events, air quotes, of the movie are what go on to inspire the fictional stories. Um, this one being Jeffrey Chaucer's A Knight's Tale, which is a short story in the Canterbury Tales. This movie was written, directed, and produced by Brian Helgeland. As a writer, he's mostly done dramas and suspense, uh, L.A. Confidential, Payback, um, Conspiracy Theory, being films that he did before this. But as a director, there's not much under his belt. Payback was the first film he ever directed. Uh, this would only be his second, so not a lot, not a lot of experience. But he would go on to write and direct our destination film, Forty Two. So could this be our first connecting director? Possibly, maybe, maybe possibly. No, that was uh, that distinction is held by uh, the director to Green Mile and Shawshank. Yeah, uh, yeah, Frank DeBont. Ah, oh, yes, yes. Thank you for the reminder. Okay, so but he's our second connecting director until i'm corrected uh in terms of production though he tends to back his own stuff like la confidential um he did co-produce this one with todd black and tim van Rellum. tom black being known for romances like wrestling ernest hemingway and career poisoning comedies like stop or my mom will shoot and tim van Rellum 
is known for backing straight to the wood chipper suspense in action films, most notably Dragon Ball Evolution. Oh, God. Mm. Oh, God. Stop yeah. it. My mom will shoot in Dragon Ball Evolution. Oh, my God. That's two consecutive kick in the nuts. Yeah, and these two guys said, yeah, we'll back your film, Brian. This sounds like a hit. Um, in terms of casts, uh, I, I guess you could sum these guys up as talented up-and-comers and reliably middle-grounders. Uh, the primary cast being, uh, as noted already, Heath Ledger, Paul Bettany, Shannon, Mark Addy, Laura Frazier, Alan Tudyk, and Rufus Sewell. Uh, Heath Ledger plays William Thatcher, the hero. Um, he was just coming out of teen movies like 10 Things I Hate About You and had done The Patriot just before this. Um, be a few years before Dark Knight, but he was a rising star. And unfortunately, he's died before his time. Uh, Rufus Sewell plays Count Adamar, the villain of our story. And from his career before this, almost exclusively historical period pieces and definitely suited for villainy in those roles. And if you want proof, just go watch him in the man in the high castle. It's a TV show on Netflix about world. Amazon. Nazi- Amazon. Uh, thank you. Amazon where Nazis are in charge. Yes. He plays Rufus. So well plays a uh, Ober group of viewers. Oh, oh my God. I hope I said that right. Oben Oper Gruppenfuhrer Smith. Basically, he's the head of the Nazi America or whatever they call it. His character is a little more complicated than I'm a Nazi, but it's like that's his role in the show is he's he's the head of Nazi America. He's like their their puppet commander or whatever. So, well, he's found one thing he does and he does it well, and that's playing villains. And playing the love interest here is Shannon Shashaman as Jocelyn. Mostly music videos before this has floated between romantic comedy drivel and some rather good but not blockbuster films like Wrist Cutters and Kiss Kiss Bang Bang. She was chosen here because she was cute, uh, not much else. And then rounding out the comic relief support cast, you have Alan Tudyk, Rufus, Laura, and Paul. I grew up from him because they pretty much all have uh, equal yet unique roles to play in this film. Um, Their roles are fairly emblematic of the actors playing them. Alan Tudyk is a character actor, notably known for comic characters in serious films. See Wash and Firefly. Rufus, also a character actor, usually plays more serious characters in all of his roles, whether it be comic or otherwise. Probably know him best as Robert Baratheon in Game of Thrones. Laura, uh, she plays the blacksmith in this movie, a professional actress, almost always supporting roles, does a bit of everything, but never anything big. Lydia in Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul is what she's mostly known for now. And, you know, Paul Bettany, solid character actor. You have probably know him as Vision, of course, but he's also been Silas, the psycho albino monk in The Da Vinci Code. And much like uh, the character he plays, he's not done much before this, but he does move on to bigger and better things. And finally for this, uh, what really notes makes this movie stand out is the music. Um, the music is one of the more interesting parts of this. I have a feeling Nigel's got some input on that for the trivia, so I won't go too much more in that. But everything else in this film, behind the scenes drama, there was none. Aside from um, an accident in jousting practice where Keith Ledger knocked out the director's teeth, there wasn't anything that went wrong behind the scenes. No accolades. Uh, Critical reviews were pretty much mixed at the time. Most found it charmingly anachronistic, but otherwise predictable. So in summary, A Knight's Tale is a comedy set in a not so popular medieval setting that they couldn't bother to do accurately. Um, This is the second film of a dramatic writer starring affordable talent that nobody with any good sense would back. So that's the meta. Josh... You want to give us a rundown on what the box office looked like when this movie came out? Well, as we said before, A Night's Tale was released on May 11th, 2001. It was initially released in 2,980 theaters. It did not premiere at number one. (laughs) (laughs) To the shock of no one. (laughs) Do you guys care to take a whack at what beat it out? It was on its second week of release. May 11th, 2001? Yes. So um, to put like a little bit of hints for you, A Knight's Tale premiered at number two, and it pulled in $16.5 million. 
The movie that came before it was a sequel, and it pulled in thirty-three point seven million on its second week of release. Two thousand one sequel. Is it X Men Two? No, oh, that had to have been middle. No, I think That's that was. I think that was two thousand two. Yeah, I give up, Josh. The Mummy Returns. Oh, no. good film. Oh, that's right. No, The Mummy Returns? No, that mo- film was hot garbage. That like was the, the one with The Rock. Rock. Yeah. That was good. I liked the second one. Yeah. But uh, I didn't. don't think I ever saw the third film. The movie at number three spot was <clears throat> A Bridget Jones Diary. Oh. At number four, um, Along Came a Spider. That was the uh, Morgan Freeman film, if I recall correctly. Yes, mm-hmm. it was. Um, at number five was Driven. At number six was Oof. Spy Kids on its seventh Oof. week. Of- Other mo- <laughs> well, I can't. I can't stop there. I got to say, number seven was the spectacular sequel to the hit Crocodile Dundee in Los Angeles. Lord, I forgot they even made a third one. Yeah, yeah. most people do. Most people do. <laughs> yeah. Other notables on that weekend at uh, number eight was Blow, Johnny Depp, uh, George Young uh, biopic. Oh yeah. Number nine was Memento. Number 12 was Joe Dirt, and uh, 22 was Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? I'm assuming uh, some of those, like, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou, were uh, on, like, week five, week six. Yeah, sort of. yeah. Oh Brother, Where Art Thou was on its 21st week of release. Holy shit. Yeah. Freddy Got Fingered was at number 20 on its fourth week of release. Oh, Jesus Christ. It made it that yeah. high? What? Yeah. Hannibal was on its 14th week of release and in 32nd spot. But uh, yeah, that's just its opening weekend. Um, overall, A Knight's Tale didn't do terrible in the theaters. It's expected to have made back its um, budget, mm-hmm. pulling in a total of $117 million in the box office. It ran to July 29th, 2001, where it, fi- it dropped uh, its final resting spot was at number 38 in the box office. Mm-hmm. The movie that premiered the final week of its uh, release was the 2001 epic remake, Planet of the Apes. Young Me liked that movie. Young Me did too. Old yeah. Me is afraid to rewatch it. Ditto. It ditto. And then, but uh, the number two at the box office, its closing weekend, was Jurassic Park 3 on its second week of release. Young Me hated that film. <laughs> and I never want to see it again. Well, um, I've got three lists with that on there. You're fired. <laughs> But that's about it for the box office. There wasn't a lot going around. Obviously, this wasn't one of the better years for the box office. No kidding. Between this one and last one, holy moly. Did they run out of all of the ideas? It was the late 90s, early double aughts, so yes. Ay, ay, ay. So, anywho. Yeah, that's, um, that's, that's all I've got. It's a rough week. It's a rough week at the box office. Well, I mean, I can see why The Mummy Returns was such a big hit. Whether your opinion on that movie or not, I mean, that had a pretty big hype machine behind it. But um, mm-hmm. there really wasn't a lot overall. I mean, yeah, The Fast and the Furious was released in the interim between uh, Night's Tale, Kiss of the Dragon, uh, Shrek. Yeah, there wasn't really a lot. There really was not a lot as this during the that summer. Well, normally summers are the bigger ones. Wow. Yeah. They just, they obviously did not care. Yeah. But anywho, enough about the box office. Nigel, what do you got for the uh, trivia on this movie? I got a little bit of trivia on it. Some good stuff. Um, Tom mentioned the music in the meta. The uh, We Will Rock You opening was actually filmed by the second unit as a complete joke. Um, but it was kept along with all the other rock music because the director and the film crew wanted to show that back then, People thought their music was just as good as we think ours is today. So to appeal to a modern 2000s audience, they use music from the 1970s. Okay. You, you know what they were going for? This is fact. What I'm about to tell you is fact. Um, they were trying to get to the kids who were in high school who watched the Mighty Ducks as kids. That's possible. And also, like I said, the movie no, I said is a fact. Sure. But the movie has like a tournament setting, takes place in, well, not a stadium because they didn't really have stadiums back then. But We Will Rock You, you hear that in sports stadiums all the time. And that's what they're the feel they were trying to go for is that this was a, at the time, sporting event. And they thought their music was just as cool as our music is. It was a weird decision, but it worked for the movie. So, oh, yeah, that's, I mean, it, 
definitely helped add a charm to it, in my opinion. Yeah. In addition to the 70s music, they wear tunics with bird insignias on them. Uh, The insignia strongly resembles the decal that appeared on the hoods of 1970s era Pontiac Firebird muscle cars. Think Smokey and the Bandit. Wow. Yeah. (laughs) I thought this one was funny. Tom pointed this one out to me this week. Uh, Newsweek revealed that in June of 2001, that print ads for at least four movies released by Columbia Pictures at the time, including this film and The Animal, contained glowing comments from a film reviewer who actually didn't exist. The fake critic named David Manning was created by a Columbia employee who worked in the advertising department. Manning was misrepresented as a reviewer of the Ridgefield Press, a real small Connecticut weekly paper. So fake Yelp reviews before there were fake Yelp (laughs) reviews. The 2000s really were just picking up the pace. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Nice. And there's an expression that's said in the movie quite a bit called sixes and sevens. It's used in a gambling context by Simon the Summoner to get uh, Jeffrey Saucer to gamble or Chaucer. The phrase is derived from the game of dice that originally appeared in print in Jeffrey Chaucer's Troyes and Crisdale in 1374. The term sixes and sevens means to carelessly risk one's entire fortune. Mm. I just thought that was cool, mostly because I'm a history guy. And He's the, those pretentious people you were talking about earlier, I Tom. I am really pretentious. But I don't really care that this movie's not historically accurate. But then again, I've never actually seen this film. So Really? I've, I seen, I've, seen, I've seen bits and pieces of it. Ooh. So when William notices the Nike logo, yes, the Nike logo, on the suit of armor that Kate gives him, Kate says it's in case some other knight should admire her handiwork. Uh, By the director's own admission, as stated in the commentary for the DVD, they had no idea at the time that one of the founders was, in fact, named Knight. One of the founders is named Phil Knight. Uh, Oh, Nike founder. Oh, the blacksmith's mark that Kate put on William's armor is the logo for Nike. It was actually for product placement. Nike paid for product placement in the film. (laughs) Um, Coincidentally, they didn't know this, though. They didn't know this because for product placement, most companies, if they pay your movie for product placement, you got to show them the scene where you place their product so that they can either say yay or nay, like the, the logo's. We can't see it or it's not big enough or you're degrading our company or, or our brand or whatever. It depends on how much they pay. It depends on how much they want to see it. So if they mm-hmm. fork over some big bucks and you barely put the logo in the corner of the pay or the, the shot, they're going to be like, e- you move it a little bit. So they were screening the scene for Nike executives and a Nike exec, uh, pointed out the coincidence that Phil Knight was the name of one of the founders of Nike and the movie was called a Knight's tale and all that. So, um, that is pretty uh, fun coincidence. Yeah. And it is kind of a creative way of saying like, yeah, how are you going to put the Nike swoosh in a movie where technically brands didn't really exist yet? So (laughs) that's kind of interesting, but they, they found a way. Yeah. And and it's like, it works in the context of this film because this film does not take itself seriously historically. So I feel like that that was a situation where two board members were drunk, snorting their cocaine. Like, hey, <laughs> hey, hey, hey. So you want you want to do something fun? Let's like Columbia is doing this uh, night tale movie about like a bunch of knights and shit back in like you know medieval times. Why don't we pay them a shit ton of money and tell them we want product placement? In the medieval movie, dude, that's mean, man. That's mean. Oh. Let's do it. Oh, you clever son of a bitch. <laughs> Probably exactly how that happened. <laughs> People are listening in on this be like, did they have a recording? <laughs> but that's all the most of what I got for right now. I got some other bits and pieces of trivia but some of them are kind of spoilery to the movie so i thought we'd wait till we get into the movie before i add some things in there hmm. hey i'm looking forward to this movie i've never seen it um i thought i had but no i never have i've only seen like bits and pieces of it right nice. like like random clips on youtube and stuff but i've never really watched the film interesting i think it would have at least popped up on tnt for you at some point if it had i never either it was on in the background and i never paid attention to it or i changed the channel it's Just possible. It. It's one of those films. But Josh, you've seen it before, right? Oh, yeah. I've seen it a few times. So you got any expectations going into this? Uh, okay, let me rephrase. I haven't seen this movie in a number of years. So I'm trying to like, you know, because Heath Ledger was the heartthrob of the early double aughts. He really yes. was. Yes, he was. So it's like, 
it was hard to throw a rock and not hit a Heath Ledger film that was popular at the time. And um, even right down to Brokeback Mountain. Oh, Brokeback <laughs> Mountain came out after this. That's when it did. He... It did. This is one of those movies that kind of got him going. Yeah, but it was, it was, uh, it was the Patriot well, and yeah. Brokeback, Patriot and Brokeback Mountain. See, he was doing like teen movies, like 10 Things I Hate About You and, and yeah. a couple other bits. And then this movie. And then it was the Patriot, which that was another movie that takes its historical accuracy very liberally, yes. Yeah, but yeah. it's been. Uh... I'm just saying, but his performance in the Patriot is almost universally praised. He's actually really good in that film, mm-hmm. and um, also his performance in Brokeback Mountain is universally praised. Like those two movies, with then they came out within two or three years of each other, The Patriot and Brokeback Mountain. Those showed you, oh, he can act, he can mm-hmm. act, and actually, The Dark Knight solidified, oh, he can act. And unfortunately, he died way before his time. Mm-hmm. Like you were saying there, Josh? Think, yeah, it's been a while since I've seen this movie. But I'm trying to think the last time I did see it was. but Because, uh, yeah, he was he had a bunch of movies out there for a time. And um, like I remember enjoying all of his movies. Did but you this enjoy like, this one the first time you saw it? 2001, I was a junior in high school. Yeah. <laughs> Fair ask enough. Silly, yeah, ask a yeah. silly question. Yeah, I was one of those kids that it catered to with the music. I'm like, oh, I like that in the Mighty Ducks. <laughs> That's how Josh knows. I remember this one. Greatest trilogy. But um, yeah, so I really my expectations is I honestly don't think that I'm gonna enjoy it as much as I did when I was that age. Because you know how we always talk about objective viewings and all that jazz. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm willing to bet that I'm gonna see some little inconsistencies. I'm pretty confident that my uh memories of this movie are a nostalgic trip. So I'm not expecting to like it as much as I did, but I'm not expecting to hate it. Hmm. So I'm kind of like in the middle there with my expectations on this film. But uh, that's all I've got on my expectations. Nigel, what about you? Oh, okay. you can tell Sorry. he's really looking forward to this movie. No, it's been a week. Um, no, uh, I've never seen this film. Like I was mentioning a minute ago, I have seen like random clips on YouTube and I've seen like random bits like that people have turned into memes or like they, they take the actor's head and they, they superimpose something else on it and they do the scene. So I've seen random scenes and stuff from this film. What I have seen, I enjoy, but I don't know if I'm going to like this movie. I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic. I like movies like this that don't take themselves too seriously, but I'm also a big history buff and I'm probably going to see things in this film that are going to make me go, no, that's not at all how that happened. <laughs> you know, um, especially with the fact that it takes place in medieval Europe and they're all so clean and pretty and not riddled with disease. But I, I, I'm, I this is going to I'm going to have to stop myself multiple times in this film and just say, Dan, stop. You know that that's not how it happened, but it's OK. And I'll just try to enjoy it. But I don't know if I'm going to like it or not. I really don't. I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic. I think I'm going to like it. I do like Heath Ledger. And I watched The Man in the High Castle, and I love Rufus Sewell in that movie or that show. And I do like Paul Bettany, with the exception of last week's film, but that wasn't all his fault. So I don't know. I'm just cautiously optimistic that I'm going to like it. What about you, Tom? I remember watching this film. It was like, I think a friend of mine had rented it on DVD or was on TV. And I remembered hating it so very, very much because they, the anachronistic soundtrack the not quite accurate costumes um the modern lingo and vernacular just everything pushed my pedantic buttons so hard but with subsequent viewings i have i've softened to this this movie does have a charm and maybe because time has you know, enough time has passed to take me away from a uh, late high school, early college, Tom, to a place where like, you know what? It, it wasn't trying to be on point with this. It was trying to express something else, just be a fun sort of film. And hopefully the audience will have fun with it. So on that sense, and especially Alan Tudyk's performances, um, I do love him in this movie. So for me, I know what I'm getting into. I don't think my opinions are going to change much from what they recently become. Uh, I'm definitely probably going to be a little harder on this um, in my viewing just because a little more critical eye. But, you know, it's my expectations are I'm at least going to have fun with this cheeseburger. Yeah, see, I'm looking at this as uh, 
like uh, I'm going to put this in the same category as Days of Thunder and Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey. Um, I'm willing to bet that we're going to look at the movie and we're going to be like, this is an objectively bad movie, but we had a blast watching it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's the kind of what I'm feeling this movie is going to be. We're going to be able to put it into that category. Yeah, it's a movie we've been wanting to watch for the past couple of weeks from all these other movies. But with the exception of Rudy, we haven't really got. Yeah. So that's my expectations. It's going to be a romp. Fantastic. Yes. But I wonder if anyone else has similar views as us on this. I bet you they do. Josh, would you happen to know? Oh, shit. (laughs) Oh, my God, again. I'm kidding. I remembered when we started recording. God. (laughs) Okay. Wait. No, I do have a I do have a quiz, but and uh, yes, this quiz is a good one. I'm not gonna lie; it's been a lot of time working on this. So standard rules apply. Standard rules apply. It's on a scale of one to ten. Whoever gets the closest gets the point. If you land right on it, you get two points. If you uh, if you're uh, even distance apart, whoever gets it without going over gets the point. Mm-hmm. And are these that. just like one line from the um, IMDb just lines review? From, just or lines from the review. It's fairly straightforward this time. No, no special bells and whistles to this quiz. All right, I do well with the simple quizzes. So, mm-hmm. all right. So, um, let's see. Um, because Tom was such a dick last week, um, I'm going to go ahead and let Tom go first. Awesome. See how that works. All right. So, first question to Tom. Mm-hmm. By Lanar, there's like three R's. Lanar24 said in July 2015, the plot, although a bit childish and cheesy at times, is interesting and fun with a nice sense of obtrusive humor. I think that's a seven. Nigel, I'm gonna say, yeah, I'm gonna say eight. Oh, and Dan is unto an early lead. That is a ten-star review. No, oh, well done, Nigel. He prices right at you correctly. Yeah, that's <laughs> that seems really high. Wow. All right, Nigel, to you. SGA hyphen four three zero said in May of two thousand and one. I haven't had this much fun since Galaxy Quest. Oh, somebody really liked this film. Or really hated it. Uh. I haven't had this much fun since Galaxy Quest. I'm going to say eight again. Damn it. That was going to be my guess. Um, Thompson? Yeah, hang on. I'm going to go nine. Oh, and Tom got the point. That was another 10-star review. Ooh, I'm really glad I didn't go seven. Good on me. All right, Tom. Mm-hmm. This one is by Luke of our, our 18. He said in July of 2019, 10 is honestly too high. But it doesn't deserve a 6.9. Realistically, 7.8 to 8. <laughs> this is revenge for the one I had last <laughs> week, isn't it? Oh, God. Oh, God. I'm going to say 9. Nigel? My attorney has instructed me to not answer this stupid question. But I'm going to say 8 again. <laughs> <laughs> That was a 10-star review. Oh, my God. Son of a bitch. I knew it. I well, I should have known it. You <laughs> even said 10 is too high. <laughs> Make up your mind, IMDB reviewers. <clears throat> okay, Nigel, this one's to you. It was said by Blow3 in September of 2001. At the request of a friend, I went to see A Knight's Tale, not expecting a cinematic masterpiece. I swear to God, if this is another 10-star review, you're going to be... Yeah. No, uh... oh, fuck it. I'm going to say 8 again. You know what? I'm going to say 10 now, because it's a 10, isn't it, you dick? It's a 1. Oh, technically, I win, because 8 is closer to 1 than 10. Yeah, but we both went over, so no points awarded. No, no, no. It doesn't work like that. It only works if it's even distance apart. <laughs> Damn it. Okay. <laughs> One star review. Damn it, Josh. <laughs> damn it, damn it, damn it. Uh, I've had to keep a track of this guy at this point. It's, um, it's, we're tied up to each. Yeah, yeah. This is, this is for the game. Yeah, so this is game point. Mm-hmm. This is to Tom. Said by Music Defined 29 in May of 2001. The fact that this movie got financed doesn't surprise me. <laughs> But the fact that someone would take that financing 
and actually do the movie is amazing. <laughs> if this is a 10 star, I'm going to be really pissed. I'm going to say two. Nigel? The fact that somebody gave this movie financing. What, what was the review again? He says, The fact that this movie got financed doesn't surprise me. But the fact that someone would take that financing and actually do the movie is amazing. Eight again. That was a five-star review. God damn it, he's close. Wait, two? No, you're both. I think Tom gets that one. Because it's under. Yeah, you guys are even distance apart. (laughs) Holy shit. Tom wins by the skin of his teeth. Just barely. Holy (laughs) shit. And you've gone one lower, Nigel. (laughs) But it was Dan the Eight Nigel. (laughs) <laughs> no. oh my god <laughs> these that's were really ter- good because i did not have a uh, tiebreaker question <laughs> <laughs> these were terrible reviews <laughs> but it made for a fun quiz it did yeah. it did wow these nail biters oh boy what a fucking stupid god damn i mean seriously you had like three tens in a row and they didn't even sound like uh Tom, play the music. Oh, nothing like boiled leeches and vinegar served in lead cups to pass the time away. Oh, it's so good to be rich in the Middle Ages. And welcome back to another medieval episode of The Fire Pit. I am, as always, your interspersal host, editor, and Lord Regent, Tom. And if you think this is fun, just wait until we start playing everyone's favorite game, cousin, wife, or both. Little hint, it's always both. (laughs) Oh, the 12th century is the best. And thank you for gallivanting with us here at the fire pit. We're donning our armor and raising our lances as the fire pit strikes out on its final crusade. Yes, we've vanquished the greatest, best of the natural, and took out every other would-be underdog and challenger seeking to change their stars. Now, it's on to the ever-constant star Chadwick Boseman and the holy land that is 42. It's been an arduous pilgrim's journey, but we're just about there. Hallelujah. And speaking of besting challenges, let's see how the team is handling the latest challenge in their intramural podcast sports type tournament. Yeah, see guys, see all the fun things here we can do? fun non-head trauma things but just remember what i said i'm going to be doing the actual tournament stuff this time but you guys get to watch and if you behave i'll let you go ice cream can we go on that thing over there Ooh, that looks fun oh the the spinning dragon thing i I don't know that looks a little dangerous for you but josh dan look dan where'd you go josh where did dan go over, over there. Over where? Jousting. Jousting. Joust- oh, he's just... Oh, Jesus! He's at joust! Okay, okay, you stay... Come here. Stay near to me so I can go and... Josh, where did you go? Josh? Josh! Josh! Yeah, oh, no! No, you stay put, sir! You get back! Oh, geez. Dan, you get off! No! Do- and jousting for the fire pit. The Black Knight! Jesus! How the hell did he get into that armor and on that horse so fast? He was only gone for five seconds! The joke only works if you don't overthink it, Tom. What am I saying? Dan! Dan! Away! Don't! Dan, 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 Dan! No, 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 no! Don't lean in with your head! Lower your pole! Lower your pole! Yeah, that's what she said! Jesus God! Wow! He stayed on his horse and everything! Where the hell did you come from? Okay, stay right there. Oh my god, Justice Gun. Headshot to the Black Knight. Disco Knight is disqualified. The Fire Pit wins the round. 
Dear God, dear God, Dan, Dan, are you okay? Are you okay? Just Josh, Josh, Dan, where did you go, Josh? Dan. Okay, Dan, can you hear me? Dan, Josh, Dan, Dan, Dan. Tom, Tom, stop, stop it, stop. I got it. I'm fine. Are you sure? How, how many, how many fingers am I holding up? Three. What's the capital of Montana? I wouldn't know that anyways. Yeah, I don't know that either. So, so you're fine. Yeah, why wouldn't I be? Well, the doctor said the concussions and... You, you know what, never mind, let's go get Josh and- OH JESUS! <laughs> Josh, for the love of God, stop headbutting that guy! You have a sword for a reason! Use it! Oh my god! That's what she said. <laughs> These helmets are really strong. Stop hitting me in head. Ow! Hit him harder! Go for the eyes! Spam the X button! I, I give up! I give up! Get this kid off me! And Josh of the Fire Pit wins! Young man, what were you thinking? Dude, I'm in my 30s. That's no excuse for- wait! Wait, are you- so you're fine? Yeah, broke the helmet though. How did you break the helmet? It's made of Nerf. It's- huh. So, uh, Dan and I won our matches, now you have to go win yours. Um, wow, so what's left then? Mud wrestling? Pie eating contest? Hot cockles. What's that? I guess you're gonna find out. <laughs> Hot cockles. Huh, that sounds something like you'd need a bit for. Or a whole lot of moist towelettes. But if you want to let us know about things best left to the imagination, or if you want to let people know about products that they've only imagined until now, or if you've just imagined something worth discussing and talking about, then feel free to email us at curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com. That's curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com. Just put Fire Pit in the subject line as well as why you're emailing. Whether it's for an ad, an idea for a destination, a cool list of movies for a journey, praise for the amazing editing, or what have you, and just send it on over. From there, we'll read it. Rally the loyal armies under our banner. Lay siege to our enemies. Pillage and rend asunder in the name of the Lord and King. And never respond. <laughs> you know, in all the hubbub of all this conquering, we completely forgot. Sorry, that's our bad. We'll get you on the next crusade. But that email again is curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com, capital C, capital C, capital E, capital I, at gmail.com. <coughs> oh dear, it appears as though everyone has been stricken with that pesky bubonic plague that's been going about. Oh, guess I'll have to die a gruesome death now. I'll let you get back to the episode. Thank you all for joining, and as always, good luck. <coughs> Who has a weasel that I can milk for my lozenge? <coughs> <coughs>Wait, is she in a medieval jousting competition audience, or is she getting ready to open up King Tut's tomb in 1929? Yeah, Heath Ledger looks like that scuzzy guy you always see on college campus that needs a fifth for his foosball tournament. We're like, hey, you want to play hacky sack? We're going to do some hacky sack in the quad.
If you fuck this up for us, so help me God, I will put you in a tennis movie with Kirsten Dunst. You wouldn't dare. Try me. Take me out to the jousting. Buy me some cat's meat and pot wine. This, I, I hope, hope I, I don't, don't die, die from, from the time. plague. Dude, she's trying to change you, man. Look at behind you. There's like four other bitches right there, man. Just go to one of them that's going to love you for you. Also, she wants rights, and it's like the year 1100. So just, you know, best not to touch that one with a 10-foot lance. Yes, laugh at the man drowning to death. Actually, it is kind of funny. <gasps> Obergruber Fuhrer Smith. Show me your papers. He doesn't speak in a German accent on the show. Well, he's a Nazi, so I assumed. Yeah, but he's he's a, he's an American. We're just going to make up the plot to that show. <laughs> yes. Yeah. We haven't seen it. So he's he's German and he speaks with an accent. Sure. And he walks around with a with a six inch butt plug in all the time. Yeah. But um no, but uh well I mean I'm not they've never actually said he doesn't, but uh, you know what? It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> So basically, Rufus Sewell is the expert who mastered all the moves and the counters and all the specials and the fatalities. And Heath Ledger's that fucking button masher that comes in and just like beats your ass with the same move over and over and over again. (laughs) Pretty much, yes. I hate Heath Ledger in this movie. Interesting way to tell passage of time. They couldn't afford a true montage sequence. (laughs) I love (laughs) Alan Tudjik. Those two have great rapport. Isn't it weird that Alan Tudjik and Paul Bettany in this movie have better sexual chemistry than Paul Bettany and Kirsten Dunst did in Wimbledon? Uh, <laughs> yes. Yeah, I wouldn't ba- be uh, opening your mouth that close to open windows. They didn't have plumbing, and everyone just threw their chamber pots out the windows. Yeah, That's not mud. <laughs> just stand on this guy in the lists. Stocks. No, the stock market's closed, Dan. Okay. Oh my god, his head! He just Django fed him right into the crowd. And then William Thatcher went out there naked as the day he was born. It was awkward for everyone. <laughs> but mostly the horse. <laughs> Wait. Wait. What? No, no, no. What? His, no. his name no, is Jesus like... of Nazareth, sir. And he was born in Bethlehem. That's about as far away from England as you can get. No, he's English and we all know it. Haven't you been to church at any time here recently, Dan? Jesus is a six foot six white man with abs. (laughs) Blue eyes? With blue eyes? Yes. He played by Henry Cavill. An Englishman. (laughs) (laughs) Shit, he was right. You mean Jim Caviezel. Henry Cavill is not played by Jesus. I know, but I was Oh, well, I was telling Tom. I didn't know what... He played Superman. See? See? Okay, so he played a Christ-like figure. Let's be honest. Superman is Christ. He is. I mean, sent by his father to save our sins, rose from the dead, leaps tall buildings in a single bound. Yeah, also powered by the sun. Shoots lasers from his eyes. It's all in the Bible. There's all kinds of weird stuff in Deuteronomy. Yeah, I prefer pre-crisis Bible. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> the canon made more sense it just went ridiculous with the new testament canon. oh wait wait till you get to the spinoffs i don't know i think the music really fits with the movie yeah i mean it's definitely historically accurate at least when i was listening to it when i was a kid i thought it was from medieval times well comparison to us uh it was that was the joke tom will edit it out proper and now back to the episode all right, but all right. Oh. all right, well, that was a knight's tale. Yes, it was, and what a tale it was. And I am pleasantly surprised. Yeah, so Thompson, Thompson, do you care to give your final thoughts after watching that film? I will start by saying this was not a good film in the, the standard sense. I mean, if you put this up against, say, Excalibur or any other films like that, uh, it's definitely not going to win any of those awards but you know what this was a damn fun film story wasn't anything clever um but you know what it didn't need to be clever to be entertaining it got the job done hats off to the director this was his second film and 
he did a damn good job. There were some techniques that he uh, was able to utilize, you know, definitely hang his hat on some cleverness in this directing style here and there. I think what really makes this movie stand out and it makes it enjoyable, it was the anachronisms. Um, And the fact that those were conscious choices. They knew going in, they didn't want to try and like add classical music or whatever. They hung their hat on those stylistic choices. They weren't just something they did. It's like, ah, just throw in whatever music, blah, blah, blah. No one's going to pay attention anyways. It wasn't lazy. And that's what gave this its style. That's what makes it so enjoyable. That's I have some more thoughts, but I think I want to hear Dan's thoughts on this movie, considering this was your first time seeing it. What about you, sir? Pleasantly surprised. Really enjoyed this film. Uh, I agree that it's not a good film by any measure like it's not going to win any awards wasn't really trying to um i think josh put it the best um when we were doing expectations this is in that fast and furious days of thunder kind of film for me where it's just a fun movie just a fun way to kill two hours Mm -hmm. um i loved the acting in this film like and i mean it's amazing like this movie had more emotional moments than Wimbledon and Wimbledon was supposed to tug at the heartstrings because it's supposed to be a romantic movie about two people falling in love. And Paul Bettany and Alan Tedrick had more ke- sexual chemistry in this film than Paul <laughs> Bettany had with Kirsten Dunst and Wimbledon. And they were supposed to be in love. Like I said it last week, Paul Bettany and Kirsten Dunst can act. They just didn't act in that film, but they were, or well, not they cause Kirsten Dunst isn't it, but Paul Bettany was really good in this film, but I'm not going to step on Josh's toes too much because I think that's what he's going to talk about. But again, Heath Ledger, what a legend. I mean, just taken way before his time, this guy can act. This guy Mm. can act. He just commands the stage, so to speak, when he's on it. And that's just amazing. I love, you know, you can tell that even on a movie like this, when there's a good actor or a couple of good actors, they raise the, the level of everyone else around them. And they make a film that's that shouldn't be good better than it has any right to be so hats off to heath ledger just a this is just a good film i really enjoyed it like i said not not a good film as like an oscar winner but a good film that it's entertaining it this is an entertaining film Mm. really fun to watch um but i don't want to keep repeating myself and i want to bounce off some of you guys so josh what about you i have got to agree i think that this movie met my uh expectations that i laid down earlier it's a lot of fun it's like it's been a few years since i've seen it um, I don't know how many, at least five, but I'd have to say that this film met every single thing that I remember. It was not nostalgia fueled. It was not um, something that's like, I really liked this growing up. This is terrible as an adult, but I liked it when I was a kid scenario. It's like, no, this movie is just as good then as it is now, just as good now as it was then. But <laughs> um, I agree with you, Tom. It's definitely not a good movie by you know the standard definition but it is definitely a fun movie and i think i called it in my expectations where i think it fits right into that category with bill and ted and days of thunder yeah just Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. there were some contrivances though i'm sorry i stepped on your toes there carry on oh no i don't agree it was it wasn't perfect and honestly i like the fact that they did use the uh modern day music with it and you could tell that that wasn't something they decided in post the very opening scene with the crowd hammering, you know, we will rock you. That was clearly a directorial choice. Yeah. <laughs> the first five minutes of the film were just them chanting, we will rock you. Yeah. So you could clearly tell that they had, they knew what they were doing. That wasn't something they did because of committee. The director went into this and be like, dude, we are just totally going to start with we will rock you. It set the tone like, for the entire film. It really did. Like, and Dan, I, I got to you know piggyback off what you said with the whole uh like the actors the good actors i mean mm-hmm. this film would have been far worse had the acting of actors been terrible yeah like if they had just hired a bunch of well they actually did hire at the time a bunch of nobodies to do these roles but i don't know it's just like it, it they hired they made some really good choices in casting and apparently heath ledger got the job for this because I don't know if it's the director or the producer, but um, he was filming um, the Patriot around the same time as this film or shortly, or he, he was just wrapping the Patriot right before he goes to do this movie. And um, when 
he was watching Heath Ledger's dailies from the Patriot and watching the rough cut of the Patriot before it was like edited and was like, I got to get this guy in this movie. And he, he got Heath Ledger into this film over his acting in the Patriot. It's like, uh, yeah, yeah. Heath Ledger was really good at, um, he, like he did a good job in his scenes and he definitely brought out the other good actors and you can really tell Paul Bettany did a fantastic job of, uh, you, not, not just that you could tell Paul Bettany enjoyed making this film. Oh yeah. When, all he, of when, when he got up there and he started doing his, um, like, his introductions and whatnot like he you could tell he was having a blast doing that oh they all were they all oh, were. yeah so it's definitely supposed to be like a testing the waters to see how ready uh heath ledger was to be a star in his own i wouldn't film. even go that this film honestly doesn't feel like it's a stepping stone for for bigger actors this film honestly just feels like it was like the one guy in the trivia said it's a bud or i'm amazed that they approved this film for budget and then they put budget to this film Th nothing about this film screams you know blockbuster nothing about this film screams uh high-end film something that's gonna like rake in all the dough because mm -hmm. this is very even on paper this would seem like a very mediocre film right. i just think it was at that time you know it's a cheap movie we got a bunch of no names look go ahead we'll, we'll green like this one yeah it, it was meant to fill a screen for a time being, but solidly made. Solidly yeah. made. But overall, I'd have to say my uh, this, I still love this movie. It definitely uh, hits all the beats for me. My expectations are met, if not <laughs> slightly exceeded. I mean, if I'm going to nitpick anything, there are some contrivances. Uh, Adamar finding out that Thatcher was poor, like that's his dad. Like, how did he find that out? He followed so, him. It showed it in the movie. He followed him. He followed him to the poor area of town. Yeah, you didn't see that? Yeah, I, I saw that he was there and he was like looking and someone was pointing up at the window and such. But for him finding out that quickly that he was, they were son and father. I mean, I get it. I get it. They needed to have that. It was, the plot was predictable, like I said. Yeah. It, we yeah, you we need, saw the piece. That. And yeah. it's the other thing is like how like you're gonna take one word off of this guy to do it. I mean, yeah, it's a major plot hole, but at the same time, it's like that's why I'm saying I'm nit this is a nitpick of mine. I think they could have done something a little more clever with that, but I I wouldn't know how unless the little girl snitched or whatever. But they have to fill like an hour and a half, two hours. It's like he finds out how he just does. He's the bad guy. Of course, he finds out. Yeah, he needed to find out. You needed that conflict so you could uh bring that story arc full circle with with the uh, prince edward or whatnot mm -hmm. and making um making out look so evil at the end this like him cheating outright that way i think kind of made him a little more cartoonish than he could have been had he just been the guy to beat but still be that good at it i i think it could have still worked but again i mean come on you started your movie with we will rock you yeah it's it's a nitpick it's not a detriment against the film i think not if the movie took itself a lot more seriously i would have more issues with the uh tipping of the spear mm. but seeing as the film does not take itself seriously and they want to make this bad guy seem bad bad guy like if they would have helped filmed him walking down the road and kicking a dog i i would have totally accepted that as in character for the guy but if this was one of those films where the bad guy is supposed to be ambiguous and it was very you know time uh What's the first, what's the term, Dan? Um, time constraints. No, the time. It's very when, when the it's very. You said it during the natural time piece. It's like it's a, the the setting is period accurate. Piece. Yeah, the, period accurate. Yeah, there you go. Period accurate. If it was trying to be period accurate, it would or and it was trying to uh, have more depth to the characters. I think that that would have been a little contrived. I, I agree with you, mm. but I think that it was on par for this movie. Yeah. I, I fall, I fall. I think it just, they pushed too hard at the end. It's like, oh, he's back. Why? Because his army's raped and pillaged. Like, now you're getting Disney with this. Well, keep in mind that they may also be uh, embellishing a bit. Because remember, they were shown to embellish things earlier, too. That's to a piss good, him off. A fair point, a fair point. Like I said, nitpicks. I thought that was one of the weak, weaker parts where they just made him an outright cheater and not just someone who was that good. But one bad pickle does not ruin this cheeseburger. Yeah, let's put it like this. The fact that we can discuss this and have specific points to discuss on that mm -hmm. means that the film had slightly more depth than it uh, 
it has on its surface, you know? Wimbledon, we like, yeah, this was stupid. And we're all like, yeah, yeah, that was dumb. Yeah, yeah. dumb. This movie was dumb, surrounded by dumb with a core filling. And Paul Bettany was trying his damnedest. Yeah. Him and John Favreau. Poor John Favreau. Yeah. I, he, I hear his back still hasn't healed. But Nigel, what yeah. about you? Any nitpicks from this film? I mean, any? No, I don't any... have any. No, no, I really don't have any nitpicks. <laughs> yeah. It's like, I'm in the same boat. I, I really don't have any nitpicks. I under, I see your nitpicks, but I, I don't, like, I just think this film for what it is, is it's fun. Mm-hmm, if it mm-hmm. tried to be more period accurate, I think I would have more nitpicks, but it did Oh, yeah, yeah. Thank God they didn't even try. It's just like, no, we're just going to have fun with this. It's rock and roll and Nike symbols on armor and quippy one-liners and Paul Bettany and Alan Tudyk being the and best. Heath Ledger's smile. Oh, that smile. Why they had to cover it up with a helmet for most of the film. <sighs> but I've run down my thoughts. <laughs> I, can, I had to find things to nitpick to have more to talk about. It's, just, it's a fun film. I'm glad I came around to it over time. And I'm glad it still holds up. It's still entertaining. Nigel, do you have any uh, anything else? No, I've, I've said my piece. Like I said, it's a, it was a good film. I was in, I was entertained. Awesome. Well, I guess that does it for tonight's show. As a reminder, you can find us on Spotify, iTunes, Amazon, or wherever fine podcasts are bought and sold. I don't know if you could buy a podcast. I don't think you do. I think you can, but ours is free for you. It costs us money to make it. It does. It does. So we pay money so you don't have to. Our regular episodes are released at Tuesdays at 6 p.m., so please like and subscribe on whatever podcast medium you choose. We really appreciate it. Um, and please drop us a like, a love, or whatever you use, and leave us a review. We really like getting those reviews, and we uh, it really helps us out in the search index. So we'll come up when you search for Fire Pit Podcast or whatever you search for to find our, our uh, podcast. And be sure to join our Discord as well. The link is in the episode's description at uh, discord.me slash firepit. Uh, also in our episode description at firepit.podbean.com, you'll get notifications of new episodes. And even better, you can engage in discussions with other fans of the show. So uh, come on in. It's a really good time. Uh, you know, you give uh, Rob and Danielle and Tyrick Thorne some company. Uh, Wink and uh, Goodnight Punk from the Shattered Order podcast joined our Discord server a while back. And they've been discussing things with us. So like I said, join our Discord and uh, uh, have some fun with us. And if you want, you can always email us at curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com, as mentioned in the interspersal. If you want to send us a long message, short message, witty message, quippy message, poetic message, it's all up to you. Also, please be sure to like us on our Facebook page and follow us on Twitter at firepitcce, both linked in this episode's description as well. And for tonight's shout outs, I would like to shout out my wife because um, I am currently on orders and not at my house where my uh, server is with the, we're hosting our movies for tonight's watchings. She she is not feeling well. It's not the COVID. I don't think she's had her vaccine, so I don't think she's got it, but she's uh, very sick. She took my call at midnight and she walked all the way downstairs to uh, turn on the server for us so that we may watch the show and uh, comment on it and make this podcast so thank you my beautiful wonderful lovely wife for doing that for me thank you carissa and uh, i'd like to shout out uh, peggy the og friend of the podcast thank you always for listening uh also want to shout out some work friends uh travis anthony nick justin thanks a lot for listening appreciate it always enjoy some of the discussions of the episodes at work um yeah and for myself, I'd like to shout out Zencaster. Uh, Zencaster is the recording s- software we utilize. Uh, it's free to utilize too, which is even better. It's how we're able to uh, record all of our watchings at the same time and provides me individual lines of recording to help with the editing. Much better than Skype because it has not let us down yet. And speaking of not letting us down, I'd also like to shout out two of our Facebook followers who have not let us down in terms of following us on Facebook and just helping to spread the word. Wickstrom and Morris, thank you both, two of our many hundreds of Facebook followers. If you want to also help along, just feel free to join in. 
and just help to keep the fire pits burning. So I'm Googling something here. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's about next week's movie. Oh. Yeah. Uh, it's about the the answer to life, the universe, and everything. Huh. But what's the question? Jackie Robinson? Hmm. Is, is, that, is that right? I think that sounds about right. Yeah. I think Jackie yeah. Robinson. Oh. Okay. So that's the answer to life, the universe, and everything. Yes. Nice. Awesome. Oh, wow. Well, we figured that out. That was easy. Oh. But where can we find Jackie Robinson? Next week's movie, 42. Ooh, I am looking forward to that. Finally, I can have the answers to everything. Well, we have successfully accomplished the penultimate uh, point on our Fire Pit Strikes Out journey. So I guess we will be watching the answer to life, the universe, and everything next week. So be sure to uh, stick around, and we look forward to seeing you next week. Until then, I've been Josh. I've been Dan. And I've been Tom. Thanks for listening. This has been a production of Curtain Call Entertainment, LLC. Stay safe out there. <laughs> Boy, that was decidedly kinkier than I thought it would be. So did you win? I, I don't really want to talk about it. What's with the limp? I don't want to talk about it. You could sit down. Why don't you sit down? No, don't want to talk about it. Changing the subject, so let me get this straight. Neither of you are concussed. None of us are seriously injured. We're going into the final game of the tournament completely undefeated. Team, I think we might just win this. Oh my god! Yes! Hey! Right. Right. Let's go up! Finally, something's going, something's going right for us for a change. You know what I'm going to go do? What's that? I'm going to go detail my Thuburu. Awesome! Yay! By the way, Tom. Yeah. We didn't really need you to play that third game of the tournament. We only needed to win two, and Josh and I already did that. Oh... So what really happened with the hot cockles? I... I don't want to talk about it. (sighs) (laughs) These magic moments. (laughs) Jesus Christ. (laughs)